Thank you, President, and congratulations on your appointment. I begin today by paying my respects to the traditional owners in the electorate I represent being the Bunurong people and the Wurundjeri people who are also the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today and all other First Peoples. I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded, that important work goes on in this state to progress towards a treaty and that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I grew up in Southern Metro my first job was at the Maccas in Elstonwick on Nepean Highway. My schooling was also in the inner south and I have very happy memories of being a drama nerd that found a place of friendship and acceptance there. It was a lovely place to grow up. I have fond memories of long afternoons at the local park with my little brother and sister and going on adventures and bike rides along the foreshore or down neighbourhood laneways. Later during my uni years, I was fortunate to spend time living in other forward-thinking cities like Vancouver and Tokyo that boast a day-to-day -day connection with the incredible local environment and a public transport system that's the envy of the world, respectively. When I would get home from these journeys, the way that I grounded myself again was to take a long bike ride through that sweet-smelling scrub on the foreshore which I've later learned was rehabilitated and nurtured by the local council and our community, past the icons of Luna Park and the Espy, and looking towards our beautiful city by the bay, or Nurm. Now, that gorgeous ride, which is as safe and pleasant as it is because it's mostly on separated cycle infrastructure, it's my commute to the electorate office. This is my home, and I'm very proud to represent our ambitious intelligent and connected community in this parliament. Going back a little further to what shaped my childhood experiences, my mum grew up on a farm that produced wheat and wool, and when I was growing up, we visited often with my grandparents who still lived off rainwater that they collected in their tanks. This gave me an appreciation um, for how precious the life-giving properties of our planet are and how we can live happily with plenty if we're judicious and thoughtful in using what's given us by nature. As well as making sure us kids had access to nature, Mum always supported me in pursuing my varied interests and hobbies, from choir through to the X-Files, whatever weird thing I was into, as well as encouraging me in my schooling. Dad, through his work as a lawyer, inspired me in me the ambition to practice law instilling in me the importance of a good education and a sense of duty to try and do something useful with your work. <laughs> he also helped me develop an early appreciation of what's turned out to be appreciate, um, love for Yes Minister. And <laughs> I feel that by maintaining some humour regarding the workings of this parliament, um, that will serve us all very well in this chamber throughout the term. I feel so blessed to have been afforded that appreciation of the city and the country and to have grown up in a house where creativity and learning were always encouraged. When I was growing up, I had a feeling that we were a nation that was proudly open. We were embracing and celebrating the diversity of our community. Multiculturalism was officially celebrated throughout the late 80s and early 90s. We were fixing the hole in the ozone layer and uh, we were globally cooperating and Australia seemed like a good global citizen. We sang Heal the World in our school assemblies <laughs> and Captain Planet was on after school. I had faith that even though there were baddies out there and in the cartoon they were in the embodiment of evils like extractivism and pollution, but there were good guys fighting back against these problems. I felt like the grown-ups had things under control. As I've lived through a series of unfortunate events, to name a few, September 11, the global financial crisis, one catastrophic bushfire season after another, from Black Saturday through to the Black Summer, that faith in the grown-ups has been eroded. Specifically, I no longer felt like our governments were acting or acting strongly enough in the interest of local people and our environment. I'm not alone in this loss of confidence. In 2021, Carolyn Hickman's groundbreaking climate anxiety study found that three quarters of young people feel that given the climate crisis, 
the future is frightening. They think that government's responses are not good enough and they feel more betrayed by them than reassured. Given the scale and the urgency of the climate crisis and the dire threat it presents for the good life for us now and for generations to come, I applaud and I am strengthened by the courage of youth climate activists, in particular the school strikers for climate. The clear-eyed focus of young people on the solutions, getting off fossil fuels and a just and rapid transition to clean energy, and their passion for action it gets me out of bed in the morning. While I'm in this place, I'll strive to stand up for people and the environment now and for generations to come. And I so far have personally pulled through those unfortunate events okay, in no small part thanks to the excellent education opportunities and the stable housing situation I was fortunate to grow up with. But I know others have not had the same luck and privilege as me. Throughout my career, I've witnessed how misfortune can befall any of us and how social and structural determinants of health can influence these outcomes. When providing pro bono legal assistance to people without housing, I saw firsthand that anyone can become homeless and it's a situation that's only become more perilous as we've seen reduced investment in public housing by successive governments and inadequate rights for those who rent their homes. Working as a law reform advocate, I've seen how anyone can fall prey to insidious marketing or in addictive products of harmful industries such as gambling. And as a local councillor, I saw our community's passion for climate action and I also saw their frustration at how slow our governments, still under the thrall of the fossil fuel industry, are to act. I also saw, as we all did, during the pandemic, that governments do have the power to act decisively and swiftly to address these issues, as during the pandemic when people were housed in hotel accommodation. The solutions really are right there in front of us. So I come here sceptical of the value of hope. Hope's what sustains us when things seem grim. And there are some grim prospects ahead of us if we fail to act on climate and inequality crises. But hope can really wear thin. Through my own experience of climate grief and anxiety, my dull dismay at visiting Franz Joseph Glacier and seeing from the historical markers its clear retreat, or diving with my sister on the Great Barrier Reef, moving with rainbow fish amongst the coral, but seeing on the seafloor below brittle bleached coral, and that deep realisation that I am likely part of the last generation to witness these places in anything like their former glory. I share the fury and the disdain of young climate activists when we are told to keep hoping for a better future. And I understand why we've moved to demanding action. And though we might notice some of the most obvious impacts of the climate crisis when we visit these exceptional natural wonders, we no longer have to look very far to see the dangerous impacts of climate change. Our homes are under threat from flooding. Extreme heat and bushfires bringing a watchful and a wearying note to our summers that used to be really carefree. And it's making our cities swelter. When I can't summon hope and despair threatens to engulf me, like many in these last few years especially, I've turned to the arts to remind me of the good in people and our creative potential. Music, theatre, writing, comedy, all creative forms help us to experience and articulate painful emotions, they help us make sense of this world, and they help us, crucially, to imagine different futures. It was reading up on sci-fi that I came across the term hope punk, which helped me face another year of turning up to fight the good fight after another summer of extreme weather destruction and just disastrous government inaction. Hope punk, was one of the Collins English Dictionary's new and notable terms for 2019. And for me, it conjures this image of a famous panel from the comic Tank Girl. Tank Girl sits on a rock, pulling on her boots against an orange sky with a cuppa at her side. I can't let things be this way, she says. We can be wonderful, we can be magnificent, we can turn this shit around. I have to believe it, and I think we all should. 
because the truth is we're past hope. Blind hope at this point is downright dangerous. Hope Punk, though, offers us a way of describing collective effort and resilience in the face of bleak times and dark forces. And at this point, we need effort and we need action. So I've come through that cynicism and instead of getting jaded, I've stayed green. And I know that I'm in very good company in pulling on my boots. Because all across our region, people and community are already turning their hope into action. In local government, I was lucky to see up close the energetic efforts of community members to care for their local environment. Greening their streets by promoting exciting ideas like an active transport and rewilding initiative, the Green Line Corridor. They're picking up rubbish from the shores of our Bay Nurm, the beautiful Birrarung or Yarra River, and on their neighbourhood streets. Our communities are moving to action. They need government to step up to. I deeply believe that we need to restore care for people and environment to the heart of our decision making. Governments have immense power to respond to these modern crises and, crucially, to action systemic responses to what are systemic issues. That's what I've come here to do and it's what I'll strive to do in this chamber and I'm immensely grateful for the privilege. My gratitude is owed in general to the people of Southern Metro who've elected me, but also, of course, more specifically, to a number of special people because as anyone seated in this chamber knows, no one gets here alone. So thank you specifically to the following people. To Sue Penicute, your work on so many issues, but in particular for animals and justice, sparked my intention, uh, attention as a young lawyer and it drew me to the Greens. I hope I can be a glimmer of the star you were as our former MP for Southern Metro. To Greg Barber, the man with a plan, thank you for your belief in me, which allowed me to picture myself standing up in this chamber in the first place. Thank you to my fellow Greens MPs, who have already been so welcoming and supportive as we learn to navigate this place, and to our brilliant and hardworking staff. Thank you to our amazing Greens volunteers across the Southern Metro region, who put in hours out speaking with the community about how we can take more effective action on climate, housing and integrity in this term of parliament. You stood on polling locations in every kind of weather for hours on end, and you were just generally inspiring and amazing. And thank you in particular to the wonderful candidates who stood in lower house districts across our region. You did our movement very proud. Of course, to my family, mum, dad, Suzanne and Richard, thank you for putting up with me, turning up for me, and your love and support that I can always count on. And to Alistair, I can depend on you like time and the tides, and I love you. Thank you for coming on this latest adventure with me. The issues our communities in Southern Metro face are local manifestations of the same great tides and trends we are all rising to hit, meet across the planet at this juncture in history. Inequality, arising in particular from increasingly unaffordable housing and ineffective and punitive justice responses that disproportionately impact vulnerable or already stressed members of our communities. I had abundant opportunity growing up in the inner south and I want every person in this state to have access to the same support and resources that I did, or better. Our biodiversity is under threat, and we need to urgently protect what's left of our wild places by expanding protections, by ending gas drilling, especially in sensitive locations like the Twelve Apostles region, and stopping logging of our precious native forests. We can also do more to green and rewild our urban spaces, harnessing the creativity and drive of our local communities as we do so. And as I mentioned, our communities are leading the charge on this. They're turning nature strips and verges back into wildlife corridors and biolinks, filled with a diversity of indigenous plants. They're minimising waste to landfill and recapturing food waste as local compost. And they're beautifying, reclaiming and restoring public spaces, like replanted sections of our foreshore, the Elster Creek Nature Reserve and the Caulfield Racecourse Reserve, to name a few personal favourites. So please, in this chamber, let's live up to our community's expectations, but also their ambitions. 
We are so lucky to be in a place where enormous opportunity exists to make this necessary transition one that benefits us socially, economically and environmentally. The steps being taken in this state to support renewables are very welcome and encouraging first step. And finally, we're seeing action at the federal level too. But let's make sure we take commensurate action to end the primary driver of the climate crisis, the coal and gas industries, so that we can look our kids in the eye, or for a growing number of us, let's face it, to have the confidence restored to bring children into this world. And we can say we met our responsibility to future generations. Our community members are planting thousands of trees and plants to absorb carbon, to shore up the foreshore against inundation and the riverbanks against erosion. A good government would stop the fossil fuel industry from cancelling out our mitigation efforts by ending coal and gas and ensuring a swift and just transition to clean energy. Volunteers are out picking up plastic every weekend, and when I'm out paddling on the Birrarung, every trip still ends with the kayak full of filthy plastic bottles come on container deposit scheme, a good government would keep up the momentum and find that next wave of plastic pollution bans to implement to tackle that next set of items dirtying our streets, rivers and bay. And locals could keep hitting the meal relief kitchen every meal, breakfast, lunch and dinner, to prep food for people experiencing homelessness but a good government would ensure that there's enough government-owned and adequately maintained public housing stock to address homelessness and housing insecurity in our state and make sure that everyone has a stable and secure place to call home. I'm actually very excited because we can do all of these things. We have huge scope in this chamber and in this building to act decisively, to support the public interest, to improve people's day-to-day -day lives and to secure a better future for our community. From ending polluting fossil fuels to creating more comfortable, healthier and public homes in this state that are all electric and efficient, the opportunities for getting it done are abundant. Let's take them together. Thank you.